Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome friends to this third and the concluding lecture on Mahatma Gandhi. In previous two lectures we have discussed his thought on non-violence, uh, Sarvodaya, Satyagraha, passive resistance and also his critique to a uh, modern civilization. In this lecture on the first half we are going to discuss his dreams about future, uh, future of India or what we can uh, also call his vision of India or his dreams of future India. So, the first, uh, first part of today's lecture, we will discuss his dreams of India, his uh, uh, vision of future India and in the second half of this lecture, we will uh, try to um, uh, critique or try to critically evaluate some of his um, uh, thought and ideas while looking at his debates with say Rabindranath Tagore or uh, B. R. Ambedkar and many other um, uh, contemporary modern Indian thinkers um, as well and what is the relevance of Gandhian thought and that is how we are going to conclude today's lecture. So, to begin with um, uh, uh, his views on um, uh, and his dreams about future India for Gandhi, India was not something as a bhog bhumi or what we can also call a land for mere enjoyment. For Gandhi, India was a karma bhumi, a land of duty where it requires your contribution, your activities, your involvement in transforming India. So, for uh, Gandhi, India was not a land for uh, mere enjoyment but a land of duty which requires a responsibility, the commitment to the uh, transformation of uh, the degrading or the um, uh, colonized status of our polity and uh, its influence on our society or culture or the degrading status of different section of Indian society. So, for Gandhi, the goal, the objective was not just to attain political freedom but also transform India socially, politically, economically by empowering the marginalized, the suppressed or the excluded communities uh, of India. So, for Gandhi therefore, the whole idea of politics which for him was uh, revolving around uh, truth or uh, non-violence was to transform the society to uh, make it um, a better society for those who are marginalized, suppressed and empower them to enable them to govern themselves. So, with that objective in mind, Gandhi thought of India as a karm bhumi, as a uh, land of duty and he all his life performed this duty through his practices of non-violence. So, that is something very uniquely original in modern political movement. Uh, in any country and Gandhi, uh, Gandhi uh, provided that moral and ethical leadership for uh, freedom struggle and also for transforming society, economics, culture and polity by empowering the masses, the marginalized. So, in his opinion, um, India uh, has uh, something unique in its um, in its um, uh, character which it uh, sustain or maintain by retaining the ancient institution. So, many uh, civilization was destroyed, but India survived because of its capacity or withstand the shock which was coming in different forms of invasion and accommodate them in its own uh, cultural civilizational ethos. 
So, India has that unique characteristic of retaining the ancient institutions, but also it is able to accommodate or resolve or remove some of the superstitions which were emerging or which came out of such ancient institutions. So, certainly the practices of untouchability or caste discrimination, gender discrimination and other kind of operations and ritualization of whole uh, uh, religion. So, Gandhi was uh, uh, aware of the capacity of India while retaining the ancient culture also to remove some of the superstitions uh, which uh, was related to such institution. And uh, uh, the uh, spiritual purification which India underwent from time to time, Gandhi thought will enable India to provide the leadership to the world in the fields of non-violent struggle and the peaceful resolution of conflict. So, India's uniquely civilizational strength or heritage of um, uh, 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 spiritual purification will enable India and place it in a unique position where it can provide the leadership role in terms of resolving the conflict through non-violent or peaceful means. And at that way we see how Gandhi is applicable uh, or relevant not just to India, but also to many other countries certainly Nelson Mandela or Martin Luther King we have discussed in the previous uh, previous lecture. So, uh, if you look at the comparison between India and the West, we find that Rabindranath Tagore in his essay Society and State makes a distinction between state and society and consider the society which is associated with Indian civilization and a state which is a more kind of instrumental power, mechanical power or concentration of violence, he associated with a British civilization. Vivekananda too set forth similar arguments about society and uh, state. Gandhi accepted distinction between state and society and further elaborated it in the inherent dichotomy between a spiritual and the moral nature of Indian society on the one hand and the politically corrupt and violent manifestation of the European society. So, Gandhi also accepted along with Tagore or Vivekananda this distinction between state and society and firmly asserted the moral and the ethical nature of Indian society on the one hand or politically corrupt and violent manifestations of a European society and therefore, he makes a distinction between Indian civilization, Indian society, Indian moral ethical characteristic on the one hand and how it can help in regenerating India from the colonial rule or from other kind of operations and uh, suppression and how it can also lead in the moral and ethical regeneration of the humanity, not just, uh, not just India also. And there he wanted West or European society to learn from India, that is the leadership position he wanted India to undertake. Uh, he even described all Western political power resembling a brute force. So, I hope you remember the distinction we have made between brute force which is physical force material force and the soul force and for Gandhi soul force is the ultimate most powerful force on the uh, on on the earth and he equated the western political power and the violence that it was or is capable of with a brute force and while depicting Indian society of ancient society of India he wrote that the political institution and power was inferior to the ethical principles and people had an independent life in villages free from the coercion of the state. So, the way Indian village society or Indian villages was able to govern itself in maintaining some kind of distance or autonomy from the government or the state or the, or the political authority of the day, Gandhi believed and rightly so that the basis of Indian uh, rule or Indian um, uh, system of governance is uh, the moral and the ethical principle which binds both the ruler and the rule together. So, unlike uh, western European uh, society where a state uh, represents brute force for Gandhi Indian society where uh, the political institution and power was also subjected to or in other uh, words inferior 
to the ethical principle. So, what we call the dharma, the notion of dharma in India is not just about religion, but it is about the uh, righteousness or um, the uh, duties and responsibility of different uh, sections, different um, authorities, different institutions and they were all um, governed by that uh, particular ethical, moral responsibilities of uh, uh, the institution. So, in a sense the uh, ethical principles were considered higher than the uh, brute uh, uh, than these political institutions and the uh, and the power and people then in that kind of scenario were able to lead a relatively independent and autonomous life unlike uh, the modern state which tries to govern every sphere of individual life and Gandhi was very skeptical of that kind of state and he therefore did not want India to follow or imitate the western model of uh, governance or state either. So, he continued to maintain his idea of the waste as politically corrupt, where concentration of power and violence Gandhi was uh, very critical of and scared of such concentration as it leads to suppression of individual and his or her creativity which for Gandhi was the basis of our progress or the development and therefore, he was very critical of uh, the concentration of power at any level and talk about more decentralization of power, village republics or Ram Raj, bottom up flow of power rather than top down flow. So, for Gandhi, the waste remains a kind of politically corrupt civilization and this continued in his later writings as well and therefore, he was very critical of and skeptical of following the waste in Indian con context also. So, while we discussed this critique of modern civilization, we have discussed that capacity of modern civilization to uh, harm the soul force or the spiritual side of humanity was tremendous even when uh, even where it is originated that is in the West and European. But if it is blindly uh, imitated and followed in Indian context, then its capacity to do harm become far more worse and therefore, he always cautioned and reminded Indian uh, 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 leaders and his followers or uh, his countrymen not to follow the uh, uh, or blindly follow the path of modern western civilization. And he uh, went on to argue that India can adopt the brute force or the force of the weapon, but it will only offer a momentary victory. So, immediate victory can be achieved by adopting the brute force or the force of weapon, then there will be no pride of India left for Gandhi. In his opinion, the hour when she adopts the path of violence will be the hour of trial for him. So, the way Gandhi thought about and argued about the essential or the essential nature of Indian society and culture, where he finds non-violence or uh, truth as the uh, manifestation of such, uh, such character or it uh, naturally uh, fit with the Indian, um, Indian uh, context. So, he wanted India to follow the path of non-violence in pursuit of truth and that is the ultimate objective of individual or the uh, collective life and that way he wanted India to provide the uh, global leadership as well. So, as he was historically situated and there was argument for using uh, violence certainly by many revolutionaries uh, and justification of violence in the name of freedom, uh, freedom movement and struggle for independence, uh, Gandhi thought that India can attain that momentary or immediate victory by resorting or by adopting this brute force or the force of the weapon. But for him, when uh, India uh, adopts such uh, 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 force, that will be the hour of trial and he will have no pride in India. So, he take pride in India precisely because of its in inherent non-violent nature and uh, search after truth. And he further stated, if India makes violence her creed and I have survived, I would not care to leave India. So, for him India is inherently a non-violent country and that gives it a unique space. 
So, she will cease to evoke any pride in me. My patriotism is sub subservient to my religion. I cling to India like a child to its mother breast because I feel that she gives me the spiritual nourishment I need. She has the environment that responds to my highest inspiration. When that faith is gone, I shall feel like an orphan without hope of ever finding a guardian. So, that is how he connect to India and think of India, where the pride that he takes from India was because of its non-violent creed and search after truth. And uh, this spiritual nourishment or uh, condition to achieve the highest ambitions of uh, life according to Gandhi is possible only in such condition. But if India adopt the violence path or that violence becomes its creed, then for Gandhi, there is no place where he can get such a spiritual nourishment and attain the highest objective of non-violence and truth. So, while speaking on the appropriateness of soul force for India, Gandhi said, India is less in need of steel weapons, it has fought with divine weapons, it can still do so. Other nations have been votaries of brute force, mainly referring to European and modern states. The terrible war going on in the Europe furnishes a forcible illustration of the truth. India can win all by soul force. History supplies numerous instances to prove that brute force is, is as nothing before soul force. Poets have sung about it and seers have described their experiences. So, Gandhi again justifying the use and the relevance of soul force not just for those who are using it as a tool for their uh, attainment of objectives, but also against whom it is used. And in that way, it will transform the relationship between oppressor and the oppressed and there will be the possibility of uh, compassion or mutual, uh, mutual cooperation and love between uh, between the uh, between the opposites so a uh, soul force uh, for uh, gandhi was something which uh, historically proved as everlasting more powerful than the brute force which can lead to destruction and perhaps maybe immediate or momentary victories but for the long term or to have a kind of sustained influence or effect the soul force remains the supreme power for Gandhi and therefore, he wanted India to not to fall in the trap of this brute force and in this um, uh, accumulation or acquiring of the weapons or that can enable it militarily, strengthen it militarily. But the soul force, if it is lost, then India can perhaps in according to Gandhi will never uh, recover or cut itself off from its own strength or civilizational, civilizational heritage. So, Gandhi wanted India to be independent and strong, so that she can engage herself in the mission of betterment of the world. And that is the point we have discussed in previous lecture. So, unlike Tagore, for whom the Indian nation, national struggle or nationalism and he discarded all forms of nationalism including Indian form and yet he remained patriotic for Gandhi. If India has to play a role in the global community of nation, it must attain independence. So, that is the political articulation of Indian context and why the struggle for freedom or a political freedom from the British rule is immediate and necessary for India to play a larger, uh, a larger role in the world to uh, in its uh, betterment. And uh, the justification of soul force is not the weapon of the weak or the coward as we have discussed. The soul force is the weapon of the strongest or those who are willingly, voluntarily ready to sacrifice their life for their cause. And uh, Satyagrahi we have discussed. So, in that way, uh, he wanted India to be morally, politically strong and independent to play the larger uh, role in the betterment of the world. So, however, while glorifying India and its civilization, Gandhi did not say that there is nothing to be learned from the western countries. And wisdom does not belong to a particular continent or race, but it also does not mean that the Asian countries 
need to imitate the west in every aspect gandhi ji believed in the inherent potential of india in offering an ideal of peace and progress to the world so while he believed in the inherent strength or the soul force or the ethical moral stand of india and that way he communicated the indian position to the british opinion in the britain and also in america or uh, north america and mobilize the world opinion in support of liberation struggle or freedom uh, freedom struggle uh, freedom struggle in india so gandhi uh, while acknowledging the uh, uh, the capacity of india also uh, acknowledge the uh, uh, the requirement to learn from the other countries including the modern uh, modern west which is positive but he was against the blind or the imitation of that civilization that practices of doctors lawyers parliament and other things we have discussed in every aspect of indian life or asian asian countries and that way gandhi was the first anti colonial thinker as well so gandhi was very confident about india's capacity or india's potential to offer the ideal of peace and progress to the world without resorting to violent of all kind that was happening during the 20th century and the first half of the 20th century have seen two world war and um, the rise of nazism and fascism which lead to unimaginable organized destruction of human life and property so in that situation he thought india can provide a moral and ethical leadership for world progress through peaceful uh, uh, peaceful method so india's destiny is not with the western way of bloody war but in living the peaceful path which emanates from a life of simplicity and divinity she must not lose her soul and resist any temptation to imitate the west so we have the modernizing elites in india which try to modernize indian society politics and economy they were thinking of reconstructing in society and polity in a very dif- uh, different way Uh, then uh, then gandhi gandhi was a kind of reassertion of indian uh, ethos of simplicity and divinity and how that can help to retain the uh, soul uh, soul force and he cautioned that one should resist any temptation to imitate the west because of the a uh, captivating force of modernity and the provis- promises of civilization but gandhi ji was very clear that modern civilization can at the best uh, promise to uh, provide bodily comfort but even it fail there miserably it cannot solve all the problem of material uh, material needs of all the uh, sections of society it can provide that to few so even uh, uh, it uh, its promises to provide bodily comfort is miserably failed so uh, he wanted uh, indian uh, uh, leaders and his countrymen to understand the trap of modern civilization and resist such temptation which uh, compromises or which obstruct their connection with the soul force so he said that the european civilization is suited to its people but not to india and attempts to bl- blindly copying it will result in it's a ruin so but at the same time one should be ready to adopt the good in it on the part of europeans they should be open to renounce the evils present in it that's the inherent corruption in their polity so gandhi ji criticized the west for its never ending search for material comforts which is making them mere slaves upholding the principle of plain living and high thinking he stated that necessity of europeans to remodel their vision of constant pursuit of material benefits or to connect with the larger ideals of uh, life to their soul to the highest ambitions in life so for gandhi the vision of future india was a spiritually enlightened society through the process of self purification so the swaraj is not just about political freedom but also about developing the capacity to govern oneself the self is very crucial for gandhi and the whole society can be spiritually emancipated so this kind of society for gandhi will be an egalitarian society 
without any discrimination based on either caste, class, gender or any such divisions and all the persons regardless of their economic status will have an equal say in the polity. So, the participation in the decision which affects the collective life should be open to everyone and at the same time women and male will enjoy the equal status in the society and there should be no practices of untouchability in future India. So, Gandhi envisioned a kind of egalitarian society and polity where there is no discrimination based on class, caste or gender and uh, there is no uh, therefore, any practices of uh, caste based discrimination such as untouchability or gender based discrimination. So, as a political system India will be decentralized to the utmost level, villages will be villages will work as independent self sufficient society to the overall progress of the country. So, the again the focus on individual the small and the autonomy of them to control their life uh, and to participate in the decisions which affect their life is something which Gandhi defines through this idea of decentralization. So, uh, he envisioned his dream of India through this word that the Swaraj of my or our dream recognizes no race or religious destinations nor is it to be monopoly of the lettered persons nor yet of moneyed men. Swaraj is to be for all including the farmer, but emphatically including the miyam, the blind, the starving toiling millions. We should wipe away tears from every eye and that becomes the crucial objective. When Jawaharlal Nehru presented his famous speech, Trist with Destiny. So, uh, to wipe away tears from each eye becomes the national, uh, national objective of free India. So, the economy, so we attain the political freedom, but uh, that was not sufficient. The next and necessary uh, uh, step after attainment of political freedom was to wipe away tears from every uh, eye. In other words, social and economic regeneration and transformation of India. So, Swaraj again is not limited to the letter class or those who have money, but it must be applicable to all including the farmers, the miyamed or the suppressed, the blind or the starving toiling millions. So, for Gandhiji, the criteria for judging the effectiveness or the necessity of any policy is that whether it is empowering these starving, toiling millions of India or not, that becomes the judgment, that becomes the criteria to judge the effectiveness or the desirability of any public policy. So, Gandhi further writes that I shall strive for a constitution which will release India from all thraldom and patronage and give her if need be the right to sin. Thraldom or patronage is something which he discarded, criticized and wanted India to have the right even right to sin. So, I shall work for an India in which there shall be no high class and low class of people. An India in which all communities shall live in perfect harmony. There can be no room in such an India for the curse of untouchability or the curse of intoxicating drinks and drugs. Women will enjoy the same rights as men. Since we shall not be at peace with all the rest of the world exploiting nor being exploited, we should have the smallest army imaginable. All interest not in conflict with the interest of the dumb millions will be scrupulously respected, whether foreign or indigenous. Personally, I hate distinction between foreign and indigenous. This is the India of my dreams. I shall be satisfied with nothing less. So, the kind of India he dreamed was India where there is no high class or low class on the basis of their economic possession and India all community lived in perfect harmony and not in segmented classified status. And in such India where communities live in perfect harmony, there will be no curse of untouchability or the intoxicating effects of drinks and drugs. 
and women and men will enjoy the same rights now he wanted india not to be part of the exploiting or being exploited and hence maintain the smallest army so that's the practical part of gandhian thinking where he was supported of non violent but willing to have such measures such as standing military to protect the national boundary or the nation from any invasions so he wanted a uh, smallest army and the interest which is not in conflict with the interest of dumb millions should be respected now it whether it is foreign and indigenous gandhi ji personally is not bother about such policies or practices and he wanted india to be such where there is this harmony and absence of absence of peace so that's basically about his views on india of his dreams now if you look at some of the uh, criticism of gandhi we find that the most renowned leader of national movement gandhi ji worked equally for the social economic reforms in the country his spiritual effective and down to earth personality made him dear to all sections of society and this we will discuss when we read a quote from sarojini naidu so after this famous trial speech of 1923 or 22 i'll just check yeah it's 1922 so um, uh, after that uh, trial speech the effect gandhi ji had not just on uh, his uh, followers but also the countrymen or the judges or the uh, administration so gandhi ji uh, uh, occupied the space in the hearts and minds of people because of his own personal life and simplicity and leading through his own examples and following intimately in his own personal life so gandhi did play a very significant role in our freedom struggle and provided the moral and ethical leadership from 1920s till india attained the independence but gandhi ji was equally involved in the social and uh, economic reforms in the society which is called positive uh, uh, or constructive programs in gandhian uh, gandhian vocabulary especially from 19 uh, 1930s uh, 30s onwards Uh, charkha and um, disciplining and other things are part of uh, or small uh, industries are part of such uh, social and economic uh, reforms his um, uh, living with the untouchables or the harijans is also a part of uh, uh, such uh, such social reforms so uh, gandhi ji was um, involved in the social and economic reforms including the political struggle for freedom so although being the most popular leaders of indian national movement he was not the undisputed one and there is many differences and critique to his ideals and uh, political method so his political vision was greatly challenged by many of his contemporary including subhas chandra bose m n roy offered distinctive alternative to his ideals of satyagraha and challenges to his ideas of varnashram came from b r ambedkar which we will discuss in a minute and this ideals or critique of gandhi's ideals of varnashram comes through his powerful book which is called what congress and gandhi have done to the untouchables and also the annihilation of caste in these two books B R Ambedkar articulated his response to the Gandhian justi- uh, Gandhi ji justification of varnashram dharma and also the politics of the congress so the freedom struggle in the beginning was divided into two direction one was for the political reforms and the other was the social religious so- social religious uh, reforms until 1920s uh, these uh, movements were uh, held simultaneously these conferences for political freedom and also for social reforms were held simultaneously in fact the beginning of indian renaissance so called is uh, uh, to begin with the religious and the social reforms movement whether it is abolition of sati or the widow remarriage or the emancipation of women or uh, arya samaj brahma samaj so they were all about social religious ref- uh, uh, reforms uh, reforms movement but suddenly after 1920s political freedom took the priority of our so, uh, uh, social and religious reforms and ambedkar and many other thinkers were very critical of such positions 
so the other challenges to gandhi uh, gandhi ji ideal uh, gandhi ji ideals of communal harmony comes from muslim league which continuously insisted on getting a separate nation for the muslims in india and hindu extremist groups equally stood against him which also led to his assassination by nathuram godse on 30th january 1948 so gandhi ji was very open to criticism and uh, uh, he was um, uh, he was perhaps the greatest leader but not the undisputed one and there was many many uh, sets or many strands of opinions and alternatives to gandhian uh, gandhian ideals when he was providing the uh, moral leadership and of course he remains the greatest and tallest of them yet there were many other ideals or uh, political methods which were simultaneously in existence and they were very critical of many programs and ideals of uh, uh, gandhi ji so these responses to gandhi ji varies from appreciative analysis to blatant condemnation however his ideas remains indispensable in in the discussions on indian policy that's the power and the relevance of gandhi ji and his thought and his political activities where uh, you have a range of responses to his ideals and political activities which may be appreciative in nature but it may also outright condemnation of the whole politics so we have seen muslim league and uh, extreme right wing thinkers like savarkar and nathuram uh, activists like nathuram godse so uh, they were uh, having a strong disagreements and condemnation of gandhian ideals of uh, acharya or uh, his um, politics of non violence so gandhi ji uh, did uh, uh, face the criticism in uh, his uh, 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 in his times when he was acting upon and thinking about some of these ideals uh, itself so to begin with from appreciative then to the more critical responses to gandhi ji we can find jawaharlal nehru who was kind of very intimate and uh, loyal supporter of gandhi ji and his programs and that comes with their bonding for political independence of india and compassion for the poor which binds them together and the method of politics that gandhi ji articulated and projected jawaharlal nehru intimately associated himself with such politics but in some other aspects they resemble polar opposites while for gandhi religion meant everything Nehru did not give it such a dominant place in his life especially in the politics and the state he envisioned so for gandhi ji religion ethics morality is something which is essential but for uh, nehru such uh, thing uh, is not really as important in the kind of politics or the state for india he was envisioning non violent and uh, simple living was for gandhi ji end in themselves but nehru considered them only as a practical means during freedom struggle to attain the freedom this means and ends the simplicity that gandhi ji promoted and envisioned was desirable for attaining the political independence enthusing strength or mobilizing the suppressed or marginalized masses but for uh, nehru india must uh, must uh, transform itself militarily politically economically and also materially as much as perhaps spiritually so in the case of their imagining of future india too they were very distinct while gandhi ji envisioned a decentralized india of self sufficient villages nehru hoped for a strong instrumental state to bring about social and economic transformations nehru was supportive of a centralized planning and mixed economy so after gandhi ji that nehru did play very significant role in shaping the institutions and the politics of modern india which we will discuss when we will discuss jawaharlal nehru but here one can also see the difference between uh, two of the greatest leaders uh, perhaps of modern india in their vision of polity state and future uh, future india now this is the quotation which i uh, wanted to uh, tell you about how, what was the place of gandhi ji in indian psyche so sarojini naidu had a lifetime association with gandhi ji and she joined in satyagraha and shared with him the passion for communal harmony 
Gandhi for her was a mentor come friend and when Gandhi was imprisoned for 6 long years in 1922, she was present during the verdict. Describing the moment, she later wrote, in the midst of all this poignant scene of many voiced and myriad hearted grief, he stood untroubled. In all his transcendent simplicity, the embodied symbol of the Indian nation, its living sacrifice and sac sacrament in one. They might take him to the utmost ends of the earth, but his destination remains unchanged in the hearts of his people, who are both the heirs and the stewards of his matchless dreams and his matchless. So, the Gandhian status was deeply embedded in the hearts and minds of uh, minds of Indian people and that cannot be taken away by incarnating the uh, uh, pers person of um, uh, Gandhiji. Um, similarly, Bal Gangadhar Tilak, despite of his admiration for Gandhiji and his deeds, had disagreements with Gandhiji's ideals of purity of means. Tilak argues, politics is a game of worldly people and not of sadhus and instead of the maxim overcome anger by loving kindness evil by good, as preached by Buddha, I, that means Tilak, prefer to rely on the maxim of Sri Krishna. In what, whatsoever any come to me, in that same way I grant them favor. So, Bal Gangadhar Tilak, the necessity of end means is to attain the ends and ends justify the means and not the means which justify the ends as for, uh, for uh, uh, Gandhiji. And uh, Tilak wanted politics to be uh, for the worldly people and not for the sadhus, uh, uh, sadhus and their ma maxim, maxims like uh, overcoming um, anger with love and kindness or evil by good, but to attain something which will justify the means for such attainments. Similarly, Rabindranath Tagore too shared a personal bond with Mahatma Gandhi. At the same time, he differed from Gandhiji on many issues such as basic education, his defense of Varnasram Dharma and many of his spiritual and mysterious statement. So, Gandhi and Tagore both believed in the need of a spiritual regeneration of India. Their differences were in the perception of power. Gandhi regarded power being of two kinds, brute force and the soul force and that we have discussed why he justified soul force over the brute force. So, he despised the former that is brute force and the later that his soul force is celebrated in his thought and politics, but for Tagore, he was suspicious of any form of power. In his own words, power in all its form is irrational. It is like the horse that drags the carriage blindfolded. So, for Tagore, the complete freedom or freedom from fear of all kind is necessary for individual creativity to grow and that can lead to a better society, more uh, more uh, empowered uh, uh, society and the way he uh, envisioned uh, society. But for Gandhiji, um, uh, the power can be divided into two, uh, brute force and the soul force and soul force is uh, uh, desirable, uh, soul force and the power of uh, 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 soul force is desirable for Gandhi's uh, uh, techniques of politics. And on uh, uh, Tagore and Gandhi, we have discussed in, uh, uh, in uh, our lecture on Tagore also, which you can also refer to to understand some of the uh, similarities and also the differences between the two greatest mind of modern India. Now, uh, uh, about Gandhiji and Ambedkar, there is a very strange relationship between these two thinkers and they continue to shape the actual practical politics of our post-independent time for and it will continue to be relevant in our political discourse. So, especially on this issue of caste, untouchability and Varnasrama Dharma, these two leaders differ from each other and vehemently opposed each other and at the same time respecting each other also. So, one of the political uh, uh, history is that while uh, Ambedkar critically uh, 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 challenged many of his ideas and uh, articulation about untouchability and uh, caste uh, discrimination, he was also respectful of Gandhiji's and, uh, and his role 
and Gandhi when uh, he was uh, uh, giving counsel to the uh, uh, forming of first interim government, he supported to uh, uh, Ambedkar's uh, nomination as the first law minister and his role in the drafting of Indian constitution. So, both leaders while opposing each other, critiquing each other also acknowledges the contribution and the expertise of uh, each other also. So, here we, here we will discuss only about their views on Varnasram Dharma and the caste uh, practices. So, in the context of Varnasrama, Ambedkar was the strongest critique of Gandhiji and the Congress and Gandhiji regarded Varnasrama as the essential system of social divisions of labor which helps in social functioning and stability. So, Gandhiji although he despised the practices of untouchability, he had no problem with the Varnasram system. So, Gandhiji in his understanding of Indian society thought of Varnasram Dharma as a kind of system of division of labor. So, he was critical of untouchability, he wanted to abolish untouchability or practices of untouchability, but he was uh, justifying or uh, okay with the continuance of Varna, Varnasram uh, uh, system. Ambedkar regarded the reorganization of Indian society on the principle of Varnasram as not only impossible, but also harmful and he considered the caste system as the factor which ruined Hindu or Hinduism and urged for a society based on the principle of liberty, equality and fraternity which is a very modern ideas of living an egalitarian life or in a egalitarian society. Now, criticizing uh, Gandhi Ambedkar writes that as defined by Mahatma, Varna becomes merely a different name for caste for the simple reason that it is the same in the essence namely pursuit of ancestral calling or whatever. I am sure that all his confusion is due to the fact that the Mahatma has no definite and clear conception as to what is Varna and what is caste and as to the necessity of either for the conservation of Hinduism. He has said and one hopes that he will not find some mystic reasons to change his view that caste is not the essence of Hinduism. Does he regard Varna as the essence of Hinduism? One cannot as yet give any categorical answers. So, how to abolish the caste and what is the relationship between caste and Varnasram, uh, Varnasram system and how it can, uh, how it is the basis of Hinduism and harming the Hindu, uh, Hindu religion. Uh, Ambedkar wanted the both uh, uh, these practices of Varnasrama Dharma or casteism to, uh, to be made unlawful and uh, therefore, and that is also connected with the uh, scriptural sanction of these practices of caste and Varnasrama according to Amid, uh, Ambedkar. Gandhiji thought of it as a practices which developed later and it has no sanction in the uh, scriptures or an ancient texts and Varnasrama Dharma therefore, is something which is justifiable, which uh, is based on the division of uh, uh, labor and it has nothing to do with the caste uh, practice uh, discrimination or untouchability, but for Ambedkar that uh, uh, both are uh, same and without, uh, without abolishing the both one cannot really discriminate the other and it sustain each other, uh, each other in a way. So, he has very strong uh, uh, opposition to Gandhi's uh, views on uh, caste and um, uh, in fact, uh, he uh, unwillingly compromised um, with Gandhiji uh, in Pune pact when there is separate communal award to the oppressed caste, uh, caste of India. And finally, he, uh, he uh, we will discuss while we will discuss Ambedkar, finally he uh, changed his religion or converted from Hinduism to, to Buddhism to create a society which is based on the principle of liberty, equality and fraternity. So, now finally, uh, if we uh, look at the uh, complicated relationship between Savarkar and uh, Gandhi, we find they share a very complicated uh, relationship and Savarkar writes that the exit from Indian world of a powerful personality like Lokmanya Tilak usurred in the mad intoxication of Khilafat agitation conspiring with cult of Charkha as a way of Swaraj in one year. 
it is to be won by the perverse doctrine of non-violence and truth. The non-cooperation movement for Swaraj based on these twin principles was a movement without power and was born to destroy the power of the country. It is an illusion, a hallucination not unlike the hurricane that sweeps over a land only to destroy it. It is a disease of insanity and epidemic and megalomania. So, Savarkar was a staunch critic of Gandhian principles which uh, he considers as unmanly or which uh, uh, take away the power of uh, uh, the power of the country in this uh, illusionary hallucination kind of ideas about non-violence uh, and truth. So, uh, we have seen different critique starting from most appreciative yet uh, uh, difference, uh, differencing or distancing himself between Gandhi and Nehru to someone between uh, Tagore and Gandhi, but also between Ambedkar, Gandhi and Savarkar and Gandhi. So, Gandhi ji remains uh, a kind of uh, um, tallest leader and yet faced all the criticism uh, uh, during his uh, lifetime and up, uh, afterwards uh, uh, as well. So, Gandhi ji was the ardent supporter of independence of India and he stressed social reforms as a means to achieve it, but his approach was essentially individualistic. So, the in Gandhian oceanic circle we have discussed how individual is at the center of all his philosophy. He regarded individual transformation and why achieving Swaraj he said that Swaraj is in our palms and we can have it as and when we want it and the way to have it or to achieve it is by stopping to cooperate with the uh, oppressor or with the uh, ruler. So, the whole idea of non-cooperation uh, with the British and that we uh, one can achieve uh, achieve the Swaraj. So, he regarded the individual transformation as the basic prerequisite of the transformation in the nation and that he writes to a letter to his nephew which he stated, please do not carry unnecessarily on your head the burden of emancipating India emancipate your own self, even that burden is very great, apply everything to yourself. Nobility of soul consists in realizing that you are yourself India, in your emancipation is the emancipation of India. So, Gandhiji very radically inverts the whole struggle for Swaraj, which is not something as an objective out there and beyond the uh, uh, biological or the physical expense of individual. He, uh, uh, he simultaneously associate the individual with India and India with the individual. So, with the, li with the emancipation of individual lies the emancipation of India, with the attainment of Swaraj to govern oneself lies the attainment of Swaraj, uh, Swaraj for India. So, for Gandhiji this uh, individual remains at the center of his uh, philosophy. So, uh, Finally, uh, to conclude, what we find is that Gandhi and his ideals were open to criticism in his lifetime and are so even in contemporary times. So, unlike many other thinkers and their followers, you see famously Ramchandra Guha said that the followers, are, uh, followers of Shivaji will not listen to anything that is against or negative about Shivaji, followers of Ambedkar will not listen to anything that is uh, negative about Ambedkar, but uh, Gandhiji has the follower is relevant for many movements and the leaders uh, even in contemporary times and yet is open and subject to all kind of criticism that is perf uh, perhaps the greatest, uh, 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 greatest uh, and unique characteristic of Gandhiji and his ideals and why it is difficult to fit him in any particular ism or ideology. So, he was uh, open to criticism in his lifetime and are so even in contemporary times and yet he remains perhaps one of the greatest leaders of modern India whose ideals have shaped not only the politics and society in India, but also of many political leaders including Nelson Mandela and uh, Martin Luther King we have seen and various social political movements including environmental movements in many countries in the world. So, Gandhiji and his ideals continue to be relevant and indispensable for any discourse on politics, uh, politics in even in contemporary India. 
So, on this lecture you can refer to some of these books like uh, India of my dreams by Mahatma Gandhi and also the great trial speech by Mahatma Gandhi in 1922 and these other texts you have seen in some of the previous lecture also which you can refer to for this lecture. So, thank you very much for uh, listening, let us know what you think about uh, this lecture and we will be happy to respond you, thank you.